We're going to be in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, uh, and uh, kind of coming off of uh, a discussion about, first of all, the early part of the book was about salvation, how great the salvation was. Then we moved into how to live the life, live the life, uh, uh, even though we're suffering in the world, we need to live responsibly. And Peter chapter 3 kind of talked about how to continue to do good, if it be in marriage, if it be in the civil courts. Um, if you look on the very first page of your notes, chapter 4, verse 4 there, you've got some bullet points there. These are some things that, that's how they're suffering. I'll explain a little bit. But they, these people are coming across some suffering. It's not persecution. Part of it is just spiritual growth. We mentioned that last week, and that's something we could probably spend some time thinking about. It's, it's just spiritual growth. You're just growing in this age, and this age is going away from God, and you're growing towards God. And of course there's going to be suffering because you're going the wrong way. You're, you're, you're swimming the wrong way. It's just, it's not going to be easy. But then also, those people that are going this way, your society that's going this way, they're going to misunderstand. Now, again, sometimes, it's, it's, sometimes we can make easy connections in our own culture, but sometimes because we come from a Christian culture, a lot of the things that are just part of our culture are just natural Christian things to do. I, mean, I know it's kind of hard to say in our age right now, everything's going crazy. But, you know, if you study history, it's always been going crazy. But anyway, these are some of the things that they're suffering in. And as we, and so now I asked a question last week at the end, and I, I do want to point this out. But the idea there, even if you should suffer for doing what is right, I'm in verse 14 of chapter 3, uh, you are blessed. The idea is there, even if you should, if, if you're doing what is right, uh, of course, if there, there's going to be growth. You're, you're, you're growing contrary to the direction of the world. Uh, the world is going to... I misunderstand, understand. They're going to misunderstand you and misjudge you. We're going to talk about that tonight. They're going to judge you according to the flesh, not according to God's standard of what He's doing in the spiritual kingdom. So there's going to be growth. There's going to be misunderstanding. But generally, the point is, if you are doing good, I mean, good for what? If you're a pagan, if you're a Muslim, if you're an atheist, if you're a Christian, if you're going to help the sick, you're doing a good deed. If you're going to be a, a responsible family person and take care of your family, pay your bills, and show, to, show up to work on time, who, that's, that's, that's the same good that the pagans are doing, the Muslims are doing, the Buddhists are doing, the Christians are doing. We're doing the same civil good. And that's where in verse chapter 3, verse 13, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? I mean, in other words, make sure that the suffering you're suffering for is because you are growing in Christ away from this culture or you're being misunderstood the culture is not really understanding your values as a Christian but generally Peter's saying if you're doing good there should be no problem here there really should not be a problem and that's what it means if and you probably shouldn't be then that's what the, the, the class of the if is if it's a fourth class it's, it's rare if and you probably shouldn't suffer for doing what is right you are still blessed and that leads us kind of where uh, we're heading on with this conversation here is that there's there's two standards if the world is rejecting you and they're misunderstanding you and you're suffering here you are still blessed so just because you're not blessed in this earth today just because in this world right now everything's not just falling in place there's nothing wrong in fact you should be in a sense suffering somehow now again be careful when I say that uh, because a lot of times we, we can throw suffering Everything about the human condition, if it be growing old, if it be sickness, if it be childbirth, if it be whatever, there's suffering involved in that. That's not the same suffering that Peter's addressing here. He's addressing, we're talking about if you're growing in Christ, if you're being misunderstood by the, the pagan society, uh, there's a judgment day coming. And if you're not blessed today, and you may not be, you're going to be blessed sometime in the future. And again, that's where this chapter is going here as we go through this. Is God is still, in the end, God is still the judge. And these people, apparently, as Peter's writing here, they may feel rejected by their society or misunderstood by their society, thus they're suffering. But they're maybe starting to compromise. They're maybe starting, well, where's God? Where's our deliverance? Where's our protection? Where's our, where's our Messiah? It's kind of like, well... The, the game's not over yet. The score is not in. And there's kind of, even in today, especially in today, there's kind of this concept that, well, if you live faithful, if you pray and you have faith, 
God's going to come to your rescue and deliver you from your suffering. Again, I, I don't want, you know, Jesus did miracles, the apostles did miracles, you know, Peter just says, if you're doing good, you're not going to suffer. But who's going to cause you to suffer if you're doing good? Things are going to work out. There's something about sowing and reaping. You sow good things, good things come back. That's a biblical principle. A man reaps what he sows. But there are still times in this life the game is not over. You're suffering. Uh, you're being rejected by people. And you think you're being forgotten by God or you don't have enough faith or there's something wrong. Peter's kind of saying, no, there, there's nothing wrong. Just... Relax. Get a picture of the whole thing. He's going to talk about time here again. I'm going to draw this for example. This right here, if this is the beginning of time, and this is the end of time, clockwise, temporal time, tick, 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 tick. This time, when compared with eternity, and I can't even draw that here on the board. It's, it's this big. Continuing this way, from, you know, this. We are somewhere on here. And in, in comparison to this eternal time that stretches as far as the east is from the west, we're almost to the end. But understand, don't be, again, you need to be careful with that statement that the end of all things is near. Now that can mean one of three things. Well, there may be more. I'm going to give you one of three things that that can mean. And you're going to bump into this continually in the Gospels. You're going to bump into it in Paul's writings. We're going to bump into it tonight. Revelation, you've got to deal with it in Revelation. <coughs> Uh, I'll just write the word wrong. Uh, maybe the early church had a misunderstanding, and maybe they thought Jesus was coming back right away. And so they talked about, he's coming back soon. He was just here. He went to heaven. He says he'll be back probably sometime this week. The end is near. Get ready. It's the end times. Look out for the Antichrist. And, and, and then they missed it. They, they did, they, it was all wrong. That you need to go to a different Bible study because that's another whole question. <laughs> because it's like, I don't think that's the case. I don't think Paul missed it, John missed it, Jesus misled them. I don't think they were wrong. I don't think Jesus meant them to understand, I'll be back sometime before Passover. It, 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 I, I'll be back. And it's going to be quick. It's going to be soon. Or you could go with the preterist. And that means when they say soon, the early, that means all of these things, whatever they say soon, it has to be written before 70 A.D. Because that is when Jesus did return. <clears throat> There's a truth to that. We've talked about this. Jesus, I think, did come back and fulfill prophecy in 70 A.D. Now, be careful when I say Jesus came back. I'm going to say it another way. Jesus' words of prophecy were fulfilled in 70 A.D. When he talked about not a stone being left and... And all these signs are going to come. Many of the signs of Matthew 24 and, and when Jesus talks about the end times were fulfilled between 66 and 70 A.D. as Rome came in. If, you're, if that's what you think he's referring to, the end of all things is near. And indeed, if you don't mind me saying it, there was an end of the age. The, the Old Testament came to an end. It didn't just, we can say it ended positionally, uh, in a moment, in the sense that in the spiritual realm, Jesus was resurrected, the temple curtain was torn, we're done. But then it took 40 years for that to kind of unwind, kind of unfold, if you understand what I'm saying. I mean, it was done. The church began on the day of Pentecost, but the temple was still there. It had to be dismantled. The Jews had to be dispersed. And so it took about 40 years for all those prophecies to be fulfilled and for the old age, the old covenant, to kind of be set aside and the new covenant to begin to get up and running. So there is the truth of the preterist there, uh, and I'm not talking end times. The preterists think all prop, that means pre and preterist means it's already all been fulfilled, everything. I think there's, I'm a futurist. I think many things are still yet in the future, yet to be fulfilled. But that doesn't mean Jesus didn't address the issues of his day. Jesus, just like Jeremiah was a prophet to his generation, Jesus was a prophet to his generation. And, and the parallels are astounding once you start looking at Jeremiah's ministry and what Jeremiah did and come and look at Jesus' voice, Jesus' tone, Jesus' words, Jesus' actions in the same place on the Temple Mount doing almost the same thing, getting the same response, uh, was saying the same thing. Je Jeremiah says, Babylon's coming. Jesus said what? Rome's coming. And it all came down just like they said. That's, that's, I believe that. I agree with that. But that's not, that's not what the preterists are talking about. They're talking about 
Revelation, everything, the Antichrist, everything's already happened. So you can go there if you want to. And then everything's got to be done, including the book of Revelation, has to be written and in the text before the fall of Jerusalem. You know, this, it wasn't written in, in, in the preterist. Revelation can't be written in 96 AD. It's got to be written in 64 AD. It's got to be written before these things take place. And now you've got some other hurdles, depending on who you are. I'm going to go with this right here. I don't think the apostles were wrong. I don't think everything's got to be done and fulfilled in 70 AD. I think in the perspective, when you get the perspective, we are living in this box of time. And we're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're in Noah's day, if you're in Abraham's day, David's day, our day, whatever, the end is almost here. Meaning, in comparatively, live your life, the end is almost here in perspective. I, that's what I'm going to look at. Now, you can, you can think about that. That there's not an easy answer. Because remember, Jesus says in Revelation, he starts in Revelation, he says, I'm coming soon. I am coming soon. I mean, when you translate that in English, if I told you supper will be here soon, you're not thinking 2,000 years. You see, I mean, so I mean, you, you still, I'm not saying I, I've, there, no one should argue with me. I'm just saying, this is where I'm addressing this issue as we approach it this evening. Okay? So, and I think that, that fits in with what Peter's trying to tell his people. You're living in this box of time. The world doesn't understand what you're doing. You are following a spiritual resurrected Lord and you're being transformed in the image of the Son of God. You're going away from the direction of society. They're not going to understand it. The very fact you are here, you're going to suffer. But really, in this box, what they call good is often what you call good too. So do what is right and they'll respect you. You shouldn't have any problems if you grow in Christ. So, now they're asking, because they still are suffering, what's wrong? Where's Jesus? And now that's kind of where we get into chapter 4. Is uh, I'm going to begin in chapter 4, verse 1, and here we go. Therefore, after we've gone through all these things, if you remember from last week, we were over in verse 14 and 15, right in there. Uh, he starts talking about the resurrection. Jesus suffered in the body, but was resurrected. And this is, I don't want to waste your time. Jesus suffered in the flesh was resurrected in the Spirit and then achieved victory and went and proclaimed, if you want to see the word right here, I've got the word on, on your first page of your notes, chapter 4, verse 6. You can see the word there is K-E-R-Y-S-S-O. -E -S That's the word, carizo, which means proclaim. There's no object with it. It just means he proclaimed something. And I am, and we could go through our verses some more, but I am saying that he proclaimed victory. He suffered in the flesh. And this, this is exactly what Peter's talking about. Christ suffered in the flesh, was made alive in his spirit, and he went and proclaimed. It doesn't say in the text what he proclaimed. It just says he proclaimed the spirits in prison. Then we weave that whole thing together. He proclaimed victory, was resurrected, and sat down at the right hand of God with all rule and authority over him. Peter goes in and says those very things in here. In fact, if you look right there in verse 22 of chapter 3, with angels, authorities, powers in submission to him. That's the victory. He, he was nailed on the cross, dead, left out for birds to eat. Except they put him in a grave. He was resurrected, made alive in the spirit. He went and proclaimed victory. And now this man who was nailed on the cross, left to die, and he did die, is now over everything. That's the victory. So in other words, are you complaining about suffering? If you are indeed suffering for the sake of Christ, if you're suffering because you are growing in Christ, if you're suffering because you're going contrary to the way the world's going and they don't understand you, if indeed that's why you're suffering, oh, get excited. Because you're going to be made alive in the Spirit, you're going to taste the victory, and you will be resurrected and receive the reward of a day that's going to come. There's a judgment. That's where we're heading here. There's, we're going to talk about judgment here. The judgment is going to make that you will be vindicated. So what were you complaining about? In other words, well, we just don't want to suffer. Maybe you don't want to be a Christian anymore. Maybe there's a better religion you can find. Maybe something's a little easier, something that everybody's already doing. Maybe a religion that's going the same way the world's going. Then you won't have to suffer. You won't have to grow. You're already there. We're all good people. Everybody's fine. You want that religion? Yeah, that's what we want. Okay, well, that's not going to get you victory in the end. That's going to get you acceptance here. You're going to fit in. You won't have to suffer. And then in the end, when you meet judgment, now you're going to cry because now you're going to... It's like, I missed everything. No one told me this is the way it worked. It's like, right, that's... Uh, we were trying to tell you. 
And that's kind of, I think, what Peter's point is here. And that lines up with the idea here of, of, of uh, the time. Okay, chapter 4, verse 1. Okay. Yes, thank you. Maybe give me just a quick answer. I'm getting old and forgetful. But now, 70 AD, some Jesus came back. No, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I said, I, when I said that, I was speaking, thank you for catching that. I, I, as it came out of my mouth, I thought, this can be misunderstood. <laughs> uh, if, yeah, 70 AD is when Jerusalem fell and the temple was destroyed by the Romans. In 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, actually it's Nebuzar Aden, Nebuchadnezzar was still up in Syria directing the war from Syria. But Nebuzar Aden, the commander of the imperial forces, came in, broke down the wall on the north side, entered Jerusalem. They sat in the gate called the Middle Gate, and they took over. Zedekiah ran, they caught him, took him up the river, had his eyes gouged out, and then sent him into in the, in the Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C. That Nebuchadnezzar, Jeremiah's message was, and Daniel, that, that's God. Now, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't God, but Jeremiah, he was unpatriotic. If you look at those, those very things right there, those bullet points, that's exactly why Jeremiah suffered in his book. He was uncommitted to their city. He was unprofessional. He didn't behave like the rest of the priesthood. He didn't behave like the rest of the prophets. Uh, he was rejected by the, his, or he rejected his family. He didn't cooperate with them, the, the priest from Anathoth. And number the second one, he was politically disloyal. He was unpatriotic. Because why? He says, there's only one way of hope in this, is that is if you surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. Because he is God's hand. Nebuchadnezzar was God's hand coming in to judge and lay flat your city unless you repent and surrender. It's like, now, now you understand how Jeremiah is going to be rejected by the priest, the king, the people. It's like, that's exactly the kind of talk that we don't need. And they're going to kill Jeremiah. Why? He's unpatriotic. He's not faithful. He's not supporting the political parties. He, he's mothing off of the priesthood. We don't need that kind of person in our society. You see? And so Nebuchadnezzar was God destroying his city, according to Jeremiah. Jesus says... Uh, in 30 AD, he's talking about not one stone left upon another, and so now Rome is going to come in, and Rome is the one that's going to fulfill the destruction in 70 AD. I think just like Nebuchadnezzar was God's hand, Rome was God's hand. So that's why I said Jesus returned to fulfill his prophecy. The preterists think they want to say that was the second coming. And really, the preterists—that's eschatologically speaking—they teach that was Jesus' second coming. Which, I mean, and then they, then they start to have to answer a bunch of questions, which means we are now in the millennial kingdom. We're now in the reign. Of, yes, the church is ruling and reigning. Christ is seated over all the authorities on earth. It's kind of like, I mean, I mean, you can make that, you can spin that and keep going on like a little gerbil on a spinning wheel trying to make that thing work. But, I mean, I don't think Jesus is, he's seated at the right, he's seated at the right hand. But I think he's watching the world and the leaders today, and he's going to return and meet them in battle. I, I, that's not the way I'm going to go. So, yeah, in 70 AD, Jerusalem fell by Rome, directed by God. In fact, Josephus, the Jewish historian, uh, was captured by the Romans. He told the general, you know this story, he told the general Vespasian that he'd had a vision that you're going to be the next emperor. And, and he, he went down to, with the Roman, Roman army, went down to Jerusalem. Josephus, who was a Pharisee and a general in the Jewish military, and would make announcements and says, please, you're not going to win this battle. This is God's hand. He was almost acting like Jeremiah and, and, and tried to talk them out of it. And when, when Vespasian, Nero died, Vespasian ends up becoming emperor. Josephus was adopted into the family of the emperor, took to Rome. That's where he wrote all the Jewish history. And so Josephus, saw, just like Jeremiah saw Nebuchadnezzar coming, Josephus saw Romans. It says, this is the hand of God. You're not going to beat this. God is judging you. Um, it's interesting, too, j j uh, just like Josephus was taken to Rome, when, when Nebuzar Aden came in in 586 into Jerusalem, it, it can, you can read it right in the text of Jeremiah. Uh, he, he came in with orders from Nebuchadnezzar. You know what those orders were? Find and bring me Jeremiah. Give him whatever he wants. Take care of his needs. Everybody else, we're killing people. But one of your, you kill everybody, they caught you, you either put them in the corral and take them to captivity. If they fight you, kill them, but find Jeremiah. 
Nebuchadnezzar told Nebuzar Aden, his, his commander, you find Jeremiah. And then they found him and asked him, where do you want to go? You want to come back to Babylon with me? You live in the palace with Daniel? You want to stay here? Where do you, wherever you want to go? And, and Jeremiah chose to stay there. That's another part of the story. But it's interesting. I think it's amazing that Nebuchadnezzar knew about Jeremiah. And then he asked, how did he know about Jeremiah? I mean, there was no talk, he wasn't on talk shows. I mean, somehow he heard about Jeremiah. I think Daniel put a bug in his ear, you know, over because Daniel had access to him. Anyway, it's just interesting. Uh, that, that, that's a long answer to your question. Jesus did not return in 70 AD, but Jesus' words were fulfilled in 70 AD. It was the hand of God through Rome destroying and fulfilling his prophecy. That's what I meant. Now the predators will say, Jesus, that was the second coming. What's that? We're going to see Jesus. Uh, right. Literally. So the predators, they don't Right. Right, exactly. They, they, yeah, the predators, that's another, they, they're doing all kinds, again, they think I'm wrong, just like I think they're wrong. But they, I think they're doing all kinds of gymnastic, linguistic gymnastics through stuff, trying to explain stuff. Okay, here we go. We've talked over there in chapter 3 about Christ's suffering and getting the victory. That's what all those verses are about, going through 16 up through verse 22. It's about suffering, resurrection, victory. Chapter 4, verse 1, therefore. In other words, since of the, because we've just stated these things about suffering, resurrection, victory. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Now, this is going to come up again in a few verses. But notice right here, attitude, attitude, mind. It's I don't want to get into the you know the Gnostic idea. The more you know, there's you know the more advantage you have. But there is something. Part of your soul is your mind. And if your mind is empty, if your mind is confused, if your mind is a vacuum, your soul is a vacuum. I mean, we were born again, right? You're born again. You got the Spirit of God living in you. But the Bible is repeatedly telling you. Let's be clear thinking. Let's get something in the head. Here's the truth. The truth will set you free. Well, I'm already free. I got born again. No, you, no you're still ignorant. You're not free. You're still captive. To, you're thinking something. Anyway, right here. Since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself. That's again talking about weaponry for a battle. Also with the same, how are you going to arm yourself? With your attitude. You're going to have to know something. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. We spent some time talking about that. Now, there's a variety of ways of understanding that and what that means. But basically, is, is if you are suffering, if you are suffering in your body, if you are in this game and you are suffering, you are going the right way. It's not talking about total sanctification. You're no longer going to sin. Some people think that's come through church history too. Uh, the holiness movement was about that. Well, if you suffer long enough and hard enough and you make a great enough commitment, you fast often enough, and there's been people actually make the statement while they're alive in front of people from the pulpit that I'm no longer dealing with sin. I mean, I mean that, that and they mean it. They, that I've conquered sin. I, I, I no longer am tempted. I mean, then you're on some kind of medication or something, or your brain dead. I mean, it's like you can, and again, you can work yourself to a place that you're just numb. But that, that's, that's not being sober-minded. That's not arming yourself with the right attitude. That's just numbing yourself into oblivion. So this, I don't think that's talking about a place where you're no longer tempted by sin. I think that's talking about he who is suffering in his body. If while you're in the flesh, and it doesn't mean if you have cancer and you're suffering with cancer, you're done with sin. That, that, again, we're not talking, when we talk about suffering here in these verses, I don't think we're necessarily talking about disastrous things happening in your life cancer or you know terrible accidents I think these are these are these are types of suffering there is growth that's available but Peter's talking I think about suffering in because you're moving this way because you're in Christ maturing you're 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 going contrary and I so this lines up with that if you allow me to say it this way he who has suffered in his body if you are suffering in your body then you are going the right way you're done with sin you're no longer going the way of the world you're going on with Christ. And that doesn't mean you'll never sin. doesn't mean you'll never be tempted. doesn't mean you're not going to slip sometimes and fall back. It just means you're growing in the right way. That's how I'm explaining that. And again, there's several ways of looking at that verse. Again, that's a that, that, is that got to be not a tough verse? He who has suffered in his body is done with sin. 
I mean, put that on a refrigerator, maybe it hang that on the refrigerator, and and, and try to explain it every morning. It's like you're gonna get a weird answer every day. I mean, I'm suffering. I'm done with sin. I mean, so you've got to keep it in the context. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Again, that still lines up. And you're still judging me as I'm teaching this because you're maturing and growing this way. You're living your life to mature, serve God, and you're no longer living the way of the world. And that leads us into verse 3. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Okay? In other words, we're still on the same track. You're done with this. You're going this way. So you're suffering, which is an indication you're done with sin. The world is sinning. They're going into this empty way of life. And you're no longer, you've spent enough time there, you're going this way. So now, the next verse, they think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. In other words, I mean, we're still, we haven't had a change, we're still saying the same thing. You're maturing and suffering, you're leaving the world behind. You used to be here, now you're going this way. If you're going this way, you're done with sin. If you're going this way, you're suffering. And if you're going this way towards God, these people over here are what? They're like... What are you doing? You're crazy. And they heap up, they think it's strange that you do not plunge into the same uh, flood of dissipation. Uh, again, the word strange, I'll give you a definition. The word strange means surprised, astonished, uh, uh, or entertained by a novel thing. I mean, they're, they're looking at you going, we have no idea what you're doing. And you can, you can relate to that. Sometimes some of the decisions that you made... Uh, it's like, what, what are you doing? We don't understand you. And so they, they, they heap abuse on you, uh, mocking you, whatever. And again, that's where we pick up in chapter 4, verse 4 on the notes. And these are some things. I do not think these people are being nailed on crosses and thrown to lions and being filleted alive. That's going to happen at different times in church history. I think Peter just says it. They're heaping abuse on you. Your culture doesn't understand you. And this is why. They were considered haters of mankind. And the reason for it, they were politically disloyal and unpatriotic. Because even on Sunday mornings, we're talking in, in, in church about the Corinthian church. And the things that are going on. Talking about temple and idol worship. And they would even have, when you'd have, there's even remains of papyri invitations to birthday parties for children. And we're going to go down to have a family birthday party in the temple. It's like going to Chuck E. Cheese's. I mean, it's... I mean, it, it was just the way, they, it's like us going to a restaurant. It was just the way their culture was. But then all of a sudden you realize, uh, this is a little demonic activity here. I'm not going to be going there anymore. What? You're not coming to Bobby's birthday party? It's like, no. And so they heap abuse on you. What's wrong? We're not good enough. And so politically disloyal, unpatriotic, part of the worship of the emperor, would, it was many Christians lost their lives for this because they refused to burn a little incense. To, this is what it would take. They come through the communities at different times, maybe on a special day or maybe a you know a, a, a annual feast. Maybe it'd be a, like a, every few years. So eventually, you're going to have to get a, a, a piece of paper that says that you've done it. And what you would have to do is you'd have to take a little pinch of incense. You know, like just a little pinch of incense. You have to walk up to the altar, sprinkle it in the fire, and say, "Long live Caesar." Or, or something. And then all of a sudden, the Christians won't do it. Because you'd have to say, Caesar is Lord. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. It'd be like us looking, really, seriously, it is no different. Al, be careful. It, it's very similar to us saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, again, in, even in the Pledge, we, we start saying that in our school again. You know, uh, Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, you know, one nation under God. You know, it's like, Oh, no, that's a, that's a hot potato right there, Un, one nation under God. But the very fact that you're pledging allegiance to a flag is like we, we, we swear allegiance to nobody except God. So it was, it was similar to that. It wasn't like they, were, they thought the emperor was the Lord, that he was God. It was just something that it gets everybody. It's like, you ever been somewhere and you're doing the Pledge of Allegiance or the Star Spangled Banner and there's somebody that's not? I mean, and they're, they're refusing to do it. They, they're looking down. I, I've seen referees at basketball games that I've, I, when I was coaching, you, we'd have they, we'd everybody stand and face the flag, and some referees would just, a, a statement, I'm against this. Now, again, I, I don't want to say this. Can someone help me on this? Are Jehovah Witnesses, 
are they kind of against that? Does anybody know? I, it, I, I'm speaking out of turn here. But, but I do know uh, certain groups of people are against American uh, imperialism and the, the flag of what it stands for, and they will not. So anyway, it makes me mad. I see they're not saluting the flag, they're not honoring the flag. Now again, what's their motive? These people right here, I'm on the other side here, they're politically disloyal because they wouldn't participate in certain feasts. Uncommitted to their city and society. Uh, participation in any kind of civic ceremony, say a basketball game, or we talk about uh, going to uh, the Olympics or the Isthmus Games or something. They, any kind of a game or civic activity, would it, they would always begin with what? A sacrifice. They would, be, they would just, that, that, they just pagans, offered a sacrifice to their gods and it was nothing. A lot of times they, they divide the meat up and different people would eat the meat. Now you're eating food sacrificed to an idol. And, and now Chris said, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be at the civic activity. I'm not going to burn incense to the emperor. It's like, whoa. You know, it's by us, us saying, I'm not going to face the flag during the basketball game or during the, during the national anthem. I'm not going to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Or unprofessional, members of a trade guild would be required to attend some kind of a meeting, often in a temple. And once again, there'd be idolatry going on there. There'd be food sacrificed to idols. And this is where the guild, if you were a plumber, you'd go to the plumber union. It'd be like being in the union. If you were a shoemaker, you'd go to the, uh, that's why uh, Lydia, the purple uh, dye, Lydia, uh, help me out. Lydia, she, she met Paul in uh, Philippi. She was from Asia Minor. What city was she from? Lydia. It was one of those, it was one of those seven letters that, that John wrote. She's from one of those. And the guilds were very strong. And you got to think, if she was, a purple, she was in the dye making, and that they, she would have to be in a guild, and that guild would involve some kind of idolatrous practice, and she maybe had left that, uh, who knows, but she, she was from that same place anyway. So, and reject their families, because you wouldn't show up at the birthday party. So all those things, we, we can explain it, but to the, the pagan, you look like you hate mankind, you're politically disloyal, you're uncommitted to the city, you're unprofessional, and you, you're breaking the family up. And so, let's go back to chapter 4, verse 3. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. And all of that swam around these practices. They think it's strange, unique. We can't believe it. We've never seen this before. That you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. We've never seen someone not salute the flag. We've never seen someone not sing or stand up for the national anthem. What, what, that's, look at that guy. He's not singing. He's, not, he's, got his, he's looking the wrong way. What, what's wrong? And they heap abuse on you, just like you would if you are at a Cubs game and a guy's not participating in the national anthem. It, boo, boo. Same thing. Different reason. But verse 5, again, now, we're done with that compare. I'm just trying to make it real, but it's not the same thing as a Cubs game and the national anthem. Something serious here, a little more serious. But they will, but but they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Now here's a tough verse, and I think I can explain it. Stay with me, you don't have to agree with this, but we've got to navigate through this. But they, those who are heaping abuse, you, those who are still in the world, you've received salvation and you're growing in Christ. You're going towards a, a look, you're looking at a, a bigger end game than they're looking at. And so now they're heaping abuse, but Peter is giving you encouragement here. But they will have to give an account. That's the word logos. It means a verbal explanation. They have, they'll have to verbally explain. It's used several times. Paul used it in Romans and in Corinthians. talks about the same idea. They're going to have to say something. They're going to be questioned. Why did you treat them this way? They're not just... people. It, I don't want to build, make too much out of this, but it's not just like God's going to hurt all the people over here and smoke the evil people, and all you people over here, you get a crown and a harp, you go over there, and we'll see. It's like judgment day's over. It's just give an account. They're going to have to give an account. That means, yeah, next, and their, their life is going to be reviewed. They're going to be held. You're not going to just get you know, off on, you know, ju just judge with the mass crowd. You're going to stand before the Lord and give an account. Remember how it says in Revelation, the books are opened? I mean, if books, plural, are open and they're going through, uh, and he's got assistance, and he's got all the time in the world, all the time in unit, you know, unit, eternity. But here it is. They will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. They're judging you today, but realize they're going to be judged 
in the future. And now here's the phrase, living and dead. They, they will have to give an account to him who is ready. First of all, the word ready, that, that, word, that is a word in, in the Greek. It doesn't mean it's happening soon. It means it's an imminent event. It's near. It's ready to happen. And the judge is, I mean, the books are, we are ready to judge. We're not, we're not holding off judgment because we can't find our records. It's like we're not holding off judgment because we haven't figured out how we're going to bring an end to the world. No, the, everything's ready. It's, we are, the judge is ready. He's just waiting. In other words, this is not a matter of, well, we've got to get some more things organized. The judge is, so it doesn't, it's not about soon, ready, it's going to happen, you know, sometime this week. It means he's just being patient. Otherwise, he could bring judgment now. So, the judge is ready to, to judge the living and dead. Now, tooth, right, you can see very clearly, living could be the spiritual life, people that are born again, and the spiritually dead. In fact, that's what I've got written in my Bible right here. I've got the word spiritual written. To don't do it. You, you can do it later. I don't think I, I would like to take those out. But at one point I wrote the living. I wrote over the top spiritual living. And I wrote over the word dead. I wrote spiritual dead. So the spiritual living are going to be judged. According, they've got salvation. The spiritually dead are going to be judged. And they're going to be sent to the lake of fire. I no longer think that's the case. I think what he's talking about here is physical living and physically dead. Meaning, it's a little bit of eschatology here, it doesn't matter if you're dead, you're still going to face judgment. And it doesn't matter if you're living, you're going to die or meet Jesus when he returns and then face judgment. He is ready to judge, he's ready to judge both you who are living and those who are dead. It, it, it's not only spiritual, it, it, it's all mankind. And the difference here is us who are still on the earth and those who have already died. They haven't escaped anything. Hell, well, they died. Well, well, let's read on. See if that makes sense. You, you, you don't have to, you know, if you listen to me teach this, you know, 10 years ago, I'd be telling, I'd be telling you something different. I teach this in 10 years, I might be telling you something different again. <laughs> Reading the same text, reading the same old NIV Bible, but maybe teaching it different. They think it's strange, you know, okay, where am I at? Verse 5, but they do not have, they, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge those who are living and those who are dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. And that's also not, it makes sense. In other words, there's, you, you do have a question. How is the gospel preached to those who are now dead? In other words, the gospel, the gospel, and this is right here, is the word, if you look on the middle of the page there again, right above where I've got the word uh, caresio, which was the word used in 1 Peter 3.19, where it says proclaim or translated preach without the object. He just proclaims something. This is, a, we, it's, it's where the gospel was preached. That is the word euangelio, and you've heard that before. It means to preach or proclaim good news. That means the, that's the word, preach the gospel. They're proclaiming the good news. So here we've got, even, it's an, even a different word. So the, I'm going to say this, and I agree with this. I think I've always agreed with this. But this right here, I've wondered about it. But verse 6, for this is the reason the gospel is preached, even to those who are now dead. How easy is it to jump over to chapter 3, verse 19, and say, well, there it is. Preaching the gospel to the spirits that are in prison, those who are dead. It's like, wrongs, we're, we're done with that. Well, this is, we're talking about dead spirits of people now, or pe people that are dead, and we're talking about them hearing the gospel when they were alive. They're not being preached to. It doesn't say that God is preaching to them, or someone's preaching to them in hell, or in the underworld, or after they're dead, they're going to have another chance. It means they're going to be judged, the living and the dead are going to be judged and asked to give an account, and that's why when the dead were alive, they heard the gospel. Because that's the basis of the judgment. And you just stay with this; will all all fits together. But you don't have to agree with it. But I think it all makes sense to me. They all, everyone is going to have to give it up. These people. Now you talk about the. Uh, oh, we're going to say saved, and the unsaved. Now in the in the judgment, there's going to be those who are saved and those who are unsaved. But the their response. These guys responded positively to the gospel. These people said no to the gospel. 
I mean, but they responded. The difference of the judgment is going to come down to the gospel. Right back to this. You are growing in Christ and suffering because you said yes to the gospel. You're going to be judged someday because of your response to the gospel. There are some, some living and some dead, that have gone this way. They're going to be judged. The living and the dead are going to be judged according to their response to the gospel. That's why the gospel was preached to them while they were preached to the dead, while they were living. Let's read this again. They will have, verse 5, but they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Now, even in the Greek right here, the word preach is in the aorist tense, which means it is an act that was done in the past that is completed with abiding results. In other words, even it, they were, it was preached. Sometime in the, it, it, the, even in the Greek uh, language, the verb, they can't be being preached to now because the tense is that's already been done. It's not like they died and now they're being preached to. They, were pre they are dead, but before they were dead, they were preached to. And that is done. They're now dead. And it won't meet again. They were preached to when they are living. Now they're over here. The results are continuing, but the preaching's done. And so, I mean, it, it all kind of fits together. And you don't have to worry about purgatory. You don't have to worry about, you know, someone coming out of hell, jumping from it, you know. You don't do any of that weird stuff. For this is the reason the gospel was preached. Why was the gospel preached to them? Because they're going to be judged because of it. Even those who are natural, those who are now dead. So that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Why was the gospel preached to them? They had the same chance. Here's what he's saying, I believe. They had the same chance that you've got. The gospel was preached to them, and they had to make a choice. Do you want to respond to the gospel and be judged by God according to the Spirit sometime in the future? Or do you want to say no to the gospel and continue to be judged by men according to the flesh? And they chose, we'll be judged according to the men by the flesh right now today. And everybody's happy, I'm happy, everybody accepts me, I'm, go I'm going the way of society. Okay, everything's good, I'm being judged according to the flesh. Well, so you were a winner. Yes, I was a winner on earth. Right, now we're going to judge, the judge is coming, he's going to judge the living and the dead by another standard, and that standard is the gospel. The gospel, yeah, I said no to the gospel. Well, I know, and you were popular, right? Everything went fine. Yeah, it was, I had a great, I was a very popular guy in the community. Right, but this is a different judgment. This is no longer judging you according to the flesh. This is judging you according to the Spirit. For this is the reason the gospel is... You know, why is Peter going through all this? He's simply telling them, I know you're suffering. Society is rejecting you. And God is not delivering you. Because that's a day that's coming. Men are judging you today because you've accepted the gospel and are growing in Christ. You are maturing. God is not delivering you because you don't need to be delivered because you're growing. It's like, coach, coach, please, it, it's, I'm getting tired. i got to tell you a story. Paul, my son, and i, I, I got to be careful because it goes online. And I, I, but he's, he's out in Colorado. He's working with some kids. Did I tell you this already? He's working with some kids. And uh, a lot of kids, are, they, they, don't, they don't, well, they just underprivileged, we'll say. And so some kids, and you know kids, you know kids like this, they don't go outside. You know, I, I play with my little grandson, I try to get him outside, take wagon rides and spray water on him, get him dirty. So he learns, you know, it's outside, we play, let him roll in the grass. You know, it's like, you know, he watches TV, he can play, he can run the iPhone, you know. But get him outside. Well, Paul's taking his kids riding bikes. They're going on the sidewalk and some little hills. Bumps. Call them hills, call them mountains, but they're bumps. And they're pedaling the bike, and, and these kids are struggling. It's like they don't like, they don't want to be outside. It's, it's terrible. It's hot. And one kid just is just freaking out. And he goes, "I've got I've got acid in my eyes. I've got acid in my eyes." Paul says, "It's sweat." <laughs> in, in, I mean, imagine never having your eyes burned by sweat. Now, why am I saying that? It made, it made complete sense here a minute. Can someone? Why was there? There's a point to that. <laughs> It was judged, something about judgment or something, experiencing something. Okay, 
Let me go on. It's a fun story, and it, and it had a point. Okay, let's go back and read and see if I can figure out what I was saying that for. I, I really, I can't wait to tell people that I like that story. I can't wait to tell the kids at school that story. I'm like, I got acid in my eyes. I got acid in my eyes. Apologies. It's, it's sweat. Just wipe your eyes. Out. <laughs> but they will have to give an account to him who's ready. What? Someone say something. Same. I like those skills. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, you guys are bike riders, yeah, yeah, they're bumps, right, yeah. But they will have to give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead, for this is the reason the gospel is preached even to those who are now dead. So they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. They had their chance. You are, oh, I know, you're suffering. And it's like, why is God not delivering? I've got acid in my eyes. I've got acid in my eyes. No, you, no, you don't. You're fine. It's called growth. You're maturing. You don't need deliverance. It's like, it's called practice. It's working out. And so the world is, is rejecting these people. And so they're like, why are these people rejecting me? Because you're growing. Why is God not helping me? You don't need help. You're riding a bike up a little bump on a hill. You've got some sweat in your eyes. You're okay. The judgment, and this was the judgment, the day of vindication, the day of dividing is in the future. Today is not the day of deliverance. Today is not the day, now be careful, you know, the day's the day of something, I know all that. But today is still the day of growth. And so he's explaining that this all continues to flow. Right? The same goes right back to Jesus suffering the flesh, being made alive in the spirit, proclaiming victory, being exalted, and now we're suffering. And if that is how, if that is how the Lord treated his son to accomplish his purpose, and that's the way he rewarded him. How is it going to be different for us? He began the chapter. Therefore, get ready to suffer. But you're not going to suffer forever. It's in this framework of time while you're growing. The world's going to reject you. God's not going to deliver you because you don't need deliverance. You're just growing. The day is coming where God will judge the living and the dead. The dead people and even the living people today, they'll all be judged. And the dead will be judged according to the gospel, because that's why the gospel was preached. They had their chance. They said no to it. So they may have been temporal winners. They may have been popular. But on the day of judgment, they're going to be huge losers. They're going to be judged. They were judged by men according to the flesh. And they were, they were popular. But they're going to be judged by God according to their response to the gospel. And they're going to be losers. And same thing with us. You have said yes to the gospel. So on that day of judgment, you're going to be welcome. You're going to be received. And, and you're being judged by men today according to the flesh. Why aren't you doing these things? Because I'm not going that direction. And they're rejecting you. So let's go back and read this again here. Here we go. But I, they will have to give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead, both the living people and the people that have already died. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead. They had their chance. So that the reason it was preached them so that they could be judged according to men in regard to the body. And they were. Men loved them. Or they accepted them. But live according to God in regard to the Spirit. In other words, they had their chance to live their life according to the Spirit. Just like you are. They had their chance. And then verse 7. The end of all things is near. That's why I started off with this earlier. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so you can pray. So he's established that fact. Right? We'll have to review that a little bit next week. But now he goes into verse 7. The end of all things is near. In other words, this is right around the corner. Your job is to realize this is the destiny. This is where you're heading. It's, it's the end is near. Now again, you could go back and say, well, he's wrong because the end wasn't near. But in his teaching, you're living in this box of time. And if, even if you're in that box of time, you're closer to the end of that box than you are to the end of eternity. So, face it, the end is near. And while you're here in this box, waiting for the end or facing the imminent end, he says, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Clear-minded means calm. It means cool. Be thinking. Uh, self-control means steady. This is right here. Listen, this he's saying. So wrap, get, this goes right back in to arm yourself with the attitude. Get this, get this in your head. Don't freak out every time you've got acid in your eyes. It's like, be calm. It's sweat. There's folks, he's basically, if you can sum this up, they write him a letter saying, we got all kinds of problems. And he's saying, folks, listen, get your head together. 
You don't have a problem. You're maturing in Christ. Be calm. Be steady. Get your mind wrapped around this. Get your attitude straight. And watch this, and this I'm going to say this and we're wrapping it up. The end of all things is near, therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled. Meaning, get something, get something in the vacuum of your soul. Have something to think about. Understand what's going on. This is exactly the way Paul taught. Watch this. Be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. See, it's so that you can pray. Now, now we spend just a moment upon prayer. In other words, if, if, if you don't understand these things, you, you're, you're not praying. You're whining. You're complaining. You're looking for an emotional escape. Or you're having some kind of spiritual frenzy. But when you have your mind wrapped around this, when you understand what's going on, and that God is not going to deliver you because you've got sweat in your eyes, it's not a big deal. You're not going to pray about that. You may pray for strength. You may pray for more information. But you're, you're, now your prayers are going to be like, oh, intelligent. You're going to actually be... The idea here, what Peter's saying is pray with some thought. Don't pray for some escape from reality. In fact, as we read on through here, it's going to actually be talking about get in tune with reality. Figure out what... I mean, this is so contrary to so much prayer that I've been exposed to. One is, is, the, is the weirder you get and the more spiritual you get and the more dizzy you get, it's like, wow, he was really in the spirit. Uh, yeah, Peter's saying no right here. Be clear-minded and self-controlled so you can pray. If you're not thinking, now again, there's, a, there's, there's, that whole, there's that whole concept from the days of the prophets all the way through the New Testament of the ecstatic speech, of the Spirit coming on somebody, the prophesying. That, that, that's a whole other topic. We're not, we're not going down that road. But what we're saying here is this is a type of prayer that you understand reality, the reality that God has created in this natural realm that you are still part of. You're going to have to live your life here. You're going to have to cooperate with the society, with the community. There's many good things you can do in your pagan society that they're going to call you good. They're going to welcome you. Come, please join us. And then you maybe are going to have to explain, well, I can't. Then they're going to heap abuse you because you're going this way. But you've got to be clear-minded and understand what is going on in the world, what is going on spiritually, and now when it's time to pray. Well, we, these are some things we need to pray about. You know what to pray about. You know what to ask for. You know what you're seeking. You're clear-minded. You're calm. You're not trying to escape reality. You're not trying to go into some kind of spiritual frenzy. You're actually in touch with reality. As it, How would you like to have a conversation? Go out to coffee with someone that just, well, you know, let's just have a conversation, and they just start going berserk on you. People look at you and say, what's it? I don't know they're talking to me. It's like, if you're going to, just talk, what, what do you think? And, and it's like, you don't want someone weird. You don't want them saying strange stuff. And you want to have some kind of knowledge we can have a con I, I have no, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Or you have no idea what I was, exp I, I called this meeting so we could talk about our project or whatever. And it's like, you, you haven't read, you haven't read the, the, the prospectus. You haven't, you're just making stuff up. You in other words, you, ever, you know what I'm talking about? You can't have a conversation with, with someone that isn't prepared. And that's what prayer is. You're going to God say, okay, we've got this meeting. These are some things that are going on. We need help here, and I need guidance here. I mean, you're still asking for assistance. You're still asking for guidance, but you're not crying because you've got sweat in your eye, if you understand what I'm saying. It's like, and guys, you haven't read the handbook because that's, you're going to suffer. Maybe you need some help and in, in, in strengthen your suffering, but I'm not going to take that away from you. That's called growth. And so anyway, we'll pick this up next week. Uh, Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And then, of course, he goes on and talks about above all else, love, and again, above all else, that actually moves on to another subject. He's switching subjects. Above, in other words, now, another point doesn't mean everything I've said is not important. Now, the really thing, and see, and you read this right here, None of that information really matters, just as long as we love each other. Now you can go to your, your big secret church and everybody just, we just love each other. We don't you know any of this stuff here. Just love, as long as everybody just gets along. It's like, right, you're right back to the vacuum of the mind, having emotional experiences, praying vanity. It's like, that's not what he's saying. He's, he's saying he's switching subjects. And now, on a list of things I'm going to give you first, he's going to talk about love. This is a new list. And above all, not everything I've said is not important. 
he's switching subjects and creating a new list. First, love. If you understand what I'm saying. Because if you, if you want to do that in another way, you can do all, all that stuff. What, really what Peter says, all that stuff's not important. All that matters is love each other deeply. Deeply just means just really, really feel the love. And it's like, yeah, no, that's, that's not what he's talking about. Okay, I'm going to quit. Uh, as always, please make sure you are, I do have a bit of an attitude. So, I mean, please <laughs> filter the attitude out and look. How do you say that? Uh, uh, help me out, Marilyn. Shoot the Keep the wheat, spit out the. How does that say? You guys don't you know what I'm saying? I know what's that? What did we used to say in Tulsa, Tony? When you hear teaching, you keep the grain, spit out the chaff or something like that. That's what I'm asking you to do. Yeah, yeah, some. It's, it's, it means keep the good stuff and throw the bad stuff out. I gave you some of everything. <laughs> thank you very much for being here. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We do thank you again for the chance to look into your word. We ask that we may understand these things correctly, that we may arm ourselves with an attitude that is in line with your word, that we may be able to think clearly and soberly and be able to handle the things that you've given to us. And, and again, we seek your strength. We seek your guidance. But Father, we do want to grow, and we know that changing us is, 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 is hard for us sometimes. And we ask for strength, and we ask for direction and continue to encourage us as we become the people you've called us to be. Again, Father, we thank you so much for this chance to be here this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you for taking time to be here.